All right, guys, today we are going to be going over a handful, and in particular, three knife brands that are, in my opinion, survival and bushcraft knife brands that are pretty legendary in the industry. Going over them, talking about them, what I think of them, and actually like look looking at these products. Now, before we get into the actual knives themselves, I think it's worth going over what really makes a legendary knife company, because I think that there is a handful of very tangible, or at least very clear factors at least for me, in my opinion. So first off, I think it's not just about the length or duration of a knife company's existence, though this does help. So a company being around for 20, 30, 40 years certainly can make it a legendary knife company, in my opinion. But also, I think that there are a few other factors as well. I would say another one of those factors is attainability. And so attainability is, in my opinion, kind of divided into two factors, either A, a knife knife or knife company is so expensive that you really can't get your hands on those knives very easily or very readily. So they're not like reasonably accessible. Or the other one would be that they are priced, you know, at a reasonable or accessible level. It's just that the production is so low that oftentimes they are so coveted that trying to get on the books or try to physically obtain one of these knives could be challenging. And so you have, <clears throat> you know, reputation or duration of time. You have, you know, the kind of ability to get one of these knives. And then you have lastly, the reputation. And I think reputation arguably is probably the biggest part of perception of a legendary company. And that is, you know, how well are these knives perceived to be made? How well are they perceived to perform? How well do they, um, or are they perceived to actually be a good company that takes care of their customers. And so when you combine or aggregate all of these, you know, um, or you do well in all of these aspects and you are able to maintain, you know, a reasonable exclusivity exclusivity of ownership, not necessarily saying that there's only so many knives out, but that only so many people own these knives, you're able to maintain a higher price potentially, or you're able to, you know, have a great deal of experience in knife making. Um, as far as a company standpoint goes, this is what gives a lot of credence to like legendary uh, knife makers, at least in my opinion and from my perception. So without any further ado, now let's dig into some legendary knives. All right, so the first one up, and we're not necessarily going in any particular order of like my most favorite to least favorite or vice versa, but the first one we're gonna be looking at is going to be the Busey Knife Group. Now, for the sake of interest, we're gonna just talk about this as a Busey knife because this is made in-house by Busey. The same people that make all the other Buseys, but this one in particular is a scrapyard knife company. That's why it has S-Y-K-C-O on there, but it's a scrapyard knife company, and this is a WS-1021. So this is a little bit of a kind of just custom doesn't really have a name it's a WS 1021 and that's just what it's called but this is essentially a Busey knife now what do I think of Busey knives of course there are different ones of course most people are familiar with things like the team Gemini but this in my opinion is actually one of the cooler and kind of unsung heroes of Busey one these um, WS 10 series knives are some of the most affordable knives from Busey while you're still getting a proprietary Busey steel SR 101 is the particular still here and of course you get a very cool custom um, or at least this one in particular has a very cool custom um, this one here of course has a very cool custom triple um, Sarah coat finish on it or triple color uh, Sarah coat finish on it camoed and so it's pretty cool in that regard but also I really do like the fact that it has a very nice rubberized handle that is super grippy super comfortable um, but overall I will say when it comes to Busey knives um, this one's one of the newest in my collection so I can't necessarily vouch for everything on it but it is definitely shaping up to be a very cool knife and I'm w one of those like you know times especially if you're a collector of anything you you know, you buy like the knives that you uh, or buy knives that you think are really cool or from brands that you've kind of always idolized. And so there's always that little bit of like hesitation to be like, is the legend as good as it seems? And for me, I can strongly say that I do think when it comes to Busey especially, that the legend is as good as it seems. These are really top notch. I mean, like I said, this coating is done very professionally. It looks very nice. Um, the handle and the fitment, everything to this guy, absolutely spot on. The ergonomics, which is a, a, a place where I feel like even some of these very high-end knives um, usually drop the ball. Uh, 
I can tell you for sure when it comes to Busey that the handle and the ergonomics are very good, very clean, and uh, yeah, absolutely no problems within that regard. I think the only thing that I kind of don't like about Busey knives is that they basically have one style of sheath to them, and so you basically just get a leather sheath, so there's nothing really more modern or more, you know, up to date, and so it kind of looks a little bit funky, especially as a rubber kind of futuristic knife in a very, very classic, um, you know, knife sheath, but even still, the sheath is well done, well made, and the overall package itself can't really complain about. It does work, it's totally functional, it's overall pretty darn good. So Busey, in my opinion, is a complete win. I would definitely buy more knives from them again, and probably will in the future. Next one up, we are going to be talking about the good old fashioned Winkler. Now this one here is a Blue Ridge Hunter in particular, but this is a Winkler nonetheless. And Winkler is one of the knife companies and brands that's more legendary, more idolized in the knife community, especially the survival knife, bushcrafting knife community, than I really think they deserve. And I've been definitely apprehensive about getting one of these knives and still not my favorite on the list. Now this blade in particular is made out of 80 CRV2 and the real problem that I have with um, Winkler knives is nothing with the materials or the maker because I do think Winkler knives does make good knives. Like there's nothing about this knife that's objectively bad. It's just objectively overpriced in my opinion. This knife here as you see it is a $360 knife. I did not pay that for it. I luckily paid a bit less for it, but it is still a very expensive knife and I don't really see where the cost is being justified. Once again, this steel is a reasonably elementary carbon steel. It's nothing that's, you know, super special. It's not a, you know, powdered metal. It's not really, you know, um, anything that's outside of the ordinary. And as I've said in previous videos, one of the basic things I dislike about this knife is that there are competitive options that use the same steel, you know, reasonably same materials. They're not Winkler knives, but they use, you know, similar materials and they come in at a third, if not less than a third of the cost of this knife. And so for me, that's what really gets me on Winkler knives. I probably would not purchase another Winkler knife, even though once again, I mean, if you like Winkler knives, you like them. If you like their style, you like their handle shape, um, you know, then those are other things that, you know, maybe you do actually want a Winkler. But in my opinion, like I said, I was apprehensive and have nearly bought Winklers in the past years, but I did pick one up by, you know, request of my subscribers and, you know, to make the video. And to be honest, like I said, I just do not think that these are objectively worth what they are trying to charge or what they do charge for them. Also, as a last kind of aside, and once again, personally, no longer objectively, I just don't really like the handle. Uh, the, I will say the jimping is pretty cool. It's pretty neat. It does dig in very well and it doesn't feel super abrasive, but these handles have this very oblong kind of just weird shape to them. And I'm not a very huge fan of that. I mean, you'll notice like, say you pick up, you know, any other wilderness blade and you know, you notice that, you know, overall pretty straight, you know, rounded, have good, you know, um, contouring to them but you know then you pick up a winkler and it has this very weird oblong shape to it and it just doesn't really um it doesn't really, it's not my favorite, it's not my preference, I guess I could say. One thing I will say, and I think most people will agree, is that I do like Winkler sheaths. They are a Kydex sheath that is covered in leather, and I think they are very high quality sheaths. They are very cool looking as well, especially if that's something you're interested in at all. They do look very cool, but um, outside of that, you know, they, they are still like a sheath, and so I don't necessarily think that the sheath makes the knife 100% of the time. So this is Bark River Knives. Bark River Knives, uh, if you guys have been around for the, in this channel, around this channel, uh, for any course or duration of time, I do really like my Bark River Knives. And as I've said in videos, I've done videos specifically on Bark River, and um, I've owned different types of Bark Rivers throughout the years. I now have just a couple of them but they are really cool. I've never had a Bark River that hasn't absolutely felt amazing in hand. I will probably end up acquiring more, you know, Bark Rivers in the future. But um, this is the Bravo 1 in particular. This one's an A2 tool steel, but overall, 
regardless to what Bark River you have, what Stila has, they're well heat treated, they're well designed, they're well made. And oftentimes my favorite thing about Bark River is I've never encountered a cheap Bark River, but at the same time too, I will say for the materials that you're getting, almost always, sometimes with these A2 tool steel versions, it's not always the best, but um, when it comes to your, you know, like CPM 3Vs, your CPM S35 VNs, your, you know, powdered metal versions of your bark rivers. I've almost never found a bark river that, like I said, they're not cheap, but they're not unreasonably expensive. And even to be fair to bark river, you know, this is an A2 tool steel version of, you know, the bark river um, Bravo one, but it is still coming in at substantially cheaper than a Winkler. So, you know, once again, some people may argue that, you know, 80 CRV two and A2 tool steel are similar performing, um, you know, tool steels. However, you can see that the Bravo one is not only bigger than this Blue Ridge Hunter, and this is 300 60. This is roughly $200. So, you know, it's bigger than the, the Blue Ridge Hunter. It is also um, thicker than the Blue Ridge Hunter. And in my opinion, it is just made better than the Blue Ridge Hunter. And once again, it feels more natural. The ergonomics are perfect. I, in my opinion, and once again, it's hard to say this without sounding bias, but in my opinion, I have never held a Bark River that did not feel very comfortable and just fit in my hand like a glove. And I think that is a lot of people's experience when you get to hold a Bark River, use one, if you're actually truly using the tool, it is absolutely just comfortable, sits in your hand, there's no hot spots, and it is fantastic. Absolutely an enjoyable experience. And so for me, Bark River is a total win. Not only will I can, or have I bought more Bark Rivers, I do continue to buy them because they simply knock them out of the ballpark. All right, guys, last one up. I know I said I was only gonna cover three, but I decided to throw these guys on the list because I like to talk about them when I can. And this is Half Face Blades. Now, Half Face Blades is a very interesting company. And I think that there are a lot of people that really enjoy uh, Half Face Blades. And to be clear, just to be upfront about Half Face Blades, I don't think, very similar to Winkler, I don't think that these are objectively bad knives. I just think that for the price, you can get much better knives. Once again, this falls into a very similar trap of Bark River, or sorry, not Bark River, Winkler, um, where their knives are very expensive. Once again, this is, you're looking at like a $300, $320 knife here, which is still ironically cheaper than Winkler, but you are looking at a knife that is still very expensive. I really don't love like on the Disaster Juniors, like the little handle, like finger grooves. I think it's just very um, like over tactical. And so, you know, you look at things like the Bravo one that was literally meant to meet a contract by the UN, uh, the Marine Raiders, the USMC Raiders. And so it was literally designed by Raiders for Raiders. And so that's a literal actual military knife, whereas this is designed by people who were in the military, but this is not necessarily designed for any department branch or any part of the military. So, you know, this is ultimately not just as a poser, but you know, this is kind of a poser in that regard. Now, to be fair, one thing I do like about most of half face blades is is that you're either getting CPM 3V, which is what this knife is made out of, or you're getting CPM S35 VN or S45 VN. I've had previous half face blades that were made out of 45 and 35, and I will say at least you're getting powdered metals. You're getting a decent performance for the package that you're getting. Overall though, I will say, I think that um, by and large, when it comes to almost every um, half face blade that I've encountered, that most of them are very much, you know, like they're lacking a lot of refinement. Like they're well made. They're just lacking some of those extra little touches that a three to $400 knife should have with it. I mean, when you look at it, like once again, this is an actual $400 semi-custom JBK layman. And you know, JBK is not the most well-known knife maker, but when you look at this as a custom, semi-custom knife, you'll notice that there are no hot spots here. The knife handle is extremely well contoured. You can see that this has a tapered tang to help with 
you know, increased comfort of your hand in you know, holding this knife for prolonged durations. You have very clean, very well-made um, grinds here. So your grind lines, your grind angles are good. Um, you know, everything about this knife is just very well thought out. Mine's a little bit dirty to be fair, but um, overall this is just a really well thought out, well executed knife. And there's um, really nothing, unless you know, you don't like a particular thing, like the handle has been polished. So some people won't like the fact that it's a polished handle, but unless there's something that you, you know, like subjectively don't like, objectively this is a well-crafted knife, right? This misses nothing. It has literally everything that you could think of on it, you know, like for comfort in use, um, this is going to be very well squared away. Whereas, you know, you look at other knives and they're just kind of, you know, I don't want to say half-assed, but kind of half-assed. I mean, this is most apparent with things like the Winkler, where, you know, you can see the handle is just not the best. This um, eyelet for your lanyard hole is not very cleanly drilled. It's a little bit hard to see on camera, but definitely off camera, you'll see that this is not like straight. Um, the actual lanyard hole is a hole, but it's not drilled straight. So it's kind of frustrating in that regard. And so, you know, there's just little things that, you know, this is just kind of missing on. And so, you know, when you're spending $300, $400, you know, this versus this. And so there's a big monumental difference between these two knives. So anyways, that is just a kind of quick aside on like expectation of a legendary knife company and expectation of expensive knives, in my opinion. I don't mind spending extra money on a knife, but I do prefer prefer that that knife perform in a way that is indicative of its cost, at least you know, if you're hoping to retain my interest in that knife. So that's my kind of spiel on it and a look at some legendary knife companies with legendary knives and whether or not I would buy them. I should say, I should note that I would probably not buy another half face blades uh, knife either, but I have purchased them in the past. I do actually own some. So anyways, that kind of wraps up the conversation. As always, guys, God bless, and I'm out.